This is level two of the CFA program, the topic on alternative investments, and the reading on introduction to commodities and commodity derivatives. Notice there are two parts to the reading, and what I want to do is I want to skip ahead to a slide that relates to that first LOS, compare characteristics of commodity sectors. And so what we've done for you on this slide is just give you a sense of the different types of commodities. And I'm guessing that these are all familiar to you. But here's the deal. We probably are not going to have clients who have an oil well in their backyard or own a farm or raise chickens or cattle or have coffee beans growing somewhere around their neighborhood. We, we might, but we probably don't have those kinds of clients. And so the question then becomes, how do we get our clients exposure to these types of investments? And your first thought ought to be something like, well, we can invest in companies like ExxonMobil or Tyson Foods or Starbucks, and, and that's true. But when you invest in those companies that trade on the big exchanges, you're getting the whole ball of their balance sheet and income statement which means you get business risk and operating risk and liquidity risk and uh, country risk and all those kinds of risks that we've talked about uh, throughout the CFA program. And so investing in those kinds of companies is almost like investing in Target and Walmart, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to find a more direct way to get exposure to this asset class because as we have been talking about in these multiple readings under the topic of alternative investments, we're searching for diversification. We're searching for the combination of, which may seem paradoxical, reduce risk, yet increase returns. And so the only way that it's possible to do that is to find uh, asset classes out there that have low or zero or negative correlation. So that's kind of our overriding goal. So let me skip to the second part of the reading title, end commodity derivatives. So this is the way that we're going to get some direct, you know, maybe kind of direct, nearly direct exposure uh, to the commodity market. And you'll see this as we go through the learning outcome statements. Uh, there's that first one, compare characteristics, life cycle. Uh, I like that third one, com contrast the valuation of commodities and the valuation of equities. This is a great link between and among different readings and different sets of uh, learning outcome statements and different emphasis on readings. We'll talk about spot and futures prices, contango, that's always a fun word to use. Uh, we'll talk about returns and then we'll end up with a conversation on commodity swaps. So let's go ahead and start again with this slide. And I'm pretty sure I have nothing to add to that based on what we talked about earlier. Uh, what I do think is this next slide is super important. You'll know that every once in a while I'll ask you to get out your phone and take a picture. Here's another good slide to take a picture of. Uh, notice that there are three columns on the right, storage and transport. I'm guessing that those are uh, less interesting questions to ask, but you probably could figure that out on an exam just based on general awareness of what's, go what's going on in the economy. But I think the far too right columns are super interesting questions to ask based on supply factors and demand factors of what might happen uh, inside of the energy and grade and metals market, et cetera, et cetera. So look at those supply factors. If you can, if you can narrow them down to just a handful, notice that weather is in there a bunch of times and political risk or political factors are in there a bunch of times. And then there are things like disease and pests and all those kinds of things. So there's supply factors in that middle column. So I would be able to answer a question that sounds something like, boy, if we have some really bad weather, you know, like rain and flood and rain, what is that going to happen? And what kind of an impact will that have on a corn crop? And the answer is probably substantial. What impact would that have on the value of your client's gold mine? Probably not nearly as much. 
In fact, I think the even more interesting questions are over on the uh, on the demand side there. And I'm guessing those of you who pay attention to anything uh, that is a current event, whenever we hear about uh, economies growing, we always look over to the energy market and say, OK, oil prices are rising, natural gas prices are rising because businesses and demand for the consumption of that energy is increasing those prices because they are ramping up their manufacturing. And those demand factors are probably very similar and should be familiar to our conversations back in our micro and macroeconomic days from level one. I find this LOS to be fairly interesting because I would have never guessed that the Institute would be this interested in life cycles of these different kinds of commodities. However, you know, there's a big section in the reading on life cycles. And so it's probably a good idea just to get a general sense. I can't imagine they would get too specific here on the exam, but a general sense uh, so crude oil processed for later use, uh, natural gas, minimal additional processing, and then refined products. I mean, you know, you just think about whenever in the United States when there's, uh, you know, some kind of a weather event in the south and a hurricane comes through the Gulf and, you know, boy, oh boy, tragedy on land and it, it hits those oil refineries. And you feel that at the gas pump throughout the country. Uh, precious metals and industrial metals, flexible life cycle. But here's probably the important thing that these things can be stored for a super long time. You know, like I have my I have my my gold ring that my wife and I bought for each other 30, 31 years ago. We, we spent two hundred dollars for each one of these things, but it's stored right on my finger. But somebody could come up to me and say, hey, Jim, let me buy that today or let me buy that in 30 years. And I would say, sure, as long as I'm alive in 30 years, that's probably be stored right there. Uh, this is the next uh, important part. Capital sensitive. Right. So in order for these uh, precious metals to be mined and then transported and then stored capital sensitive, right? Livestock, I found this to be fascinating. I would love to get to a question on the exam where they say something like, you know, how long does it take for the chicken to get to the egg or the egg to get to the chicken? So a few weeks for chicken, several years for livestock. Uh, grains, this has almost everything to do with the weather and climate, opposite times in North and South hemispheres. That's that's an interesting way of saying something like, you know what, you can grow strawberries somewhere in the world all the time. And so we can consume consume strawberries anytime uh, at our local store. Yeah, coffee is harvested all year round. I am not a coffee guy. I've had probably less than five cups of coffee in my life. Those of you who uh, our coffee people, you probably know that uh, way more about it than I do. But here's the thing. Notice our last uh, arrow point there. Farmers can use futures contracts to hedge. That's true. Of course, farmers use futures contracts to hedge, but they they hedge coffee and sugar, but they can hedge. Let's move up corn and wheat and let's move up. They can hedge uh, cattle and barrows and gilts <laughs> and they can hedge uh, gold and copper, and they can hedge oil and natural gas. And so we'll get to the hedging, speculating side of this as we move through the slide deck. But that's an important concept that inside of the spot market for all of these commodities, there's also a side market called the forward market or the futures market or the swap market where trading is going on at some time in the future. And so the price of these commodities depends on the inner workings and the inner dependence of both of these markets. Here's this uh, LOS that I was telling you about earlier. Compare the valuation of commodities uh, with the valuation of equities. Go ahead and get your cameras out and take a picture of this here. Um, clearly commodities are valued differently because a they don't have cash flows shares of stock pay a dividend bonds pay a coupon but 
oil does not. Stocks and bonds, you know, back in the old days, there used to be a piece of paper. There was physical ownership of this. You know, now it's done all electronically, but there was really no intrinsic value to that piece of paper. But with a pile of gold, there's an intrinsic value so that if the economy is expanding or declining or going like this, lots of volatility, you still have the gold, no matter what the economy is doing. So there's going to be some inherent or intrinsic value. And then look at the bottom one there. Uh, of course, commodities, you have to transport them and you have to store them. What's the cost of me storing my gold on my finger? I, I don't know. I could probably come up with some comedy, but I won't do that now. Uh, terms of delivery, you know, stocks and bonds, that's cash basis. Uh, commodities, I always think of I always think of the central market and I'm guessing that you guys, at least I'm hoping that you guys shop at your central uh, farmers market regularly to get the fresh, uh, fresh foods that we need to stay healthy. But there's actual delivery. And of course, in my example, it's actual local delivery, but it doesn't have to be local. It could be shipped all the way over there or all the way over there. Uh, this is an interesting one here about arbitrage. Notice over on the far right, we've written, it's easy to arbitrage, and that's taken right out of the reading. And I wanna make sure you understand that it's easy to arbitrage if, comma, if there are arbitrage opportunities. I don't want you to get the sense that, oh my gosh, there's uh, tons and tons of arbitrage opportunities out there in the stock and fixed income markets. However, compare it to commodities, um, it's super difficult to do it over here because in order for arbitrage to work, in many cases, you have to take actual ownership of the physical uh, commodity. And so you probably don't want to store, you know, a thousand cattle in your backyard so that you can generate a, a five cent per pound arbitrage process. Uh, I'm sorry, a five cent per pound arbitrage profit. And then the last one here, you guys probably know this, back from level one, level two, and of course in level three, how do we value equities? Price of a share of stock is the present value of the dividends or the free cash flows. Price of a fixed income security is the present value of the coupon and the principal payment. So that's discounted cash flow. But since there are no cash flows, then commodities are gonna, the commodity prices are gonna be based mostly on supply and demand. And that's why we had that slide for you just a few moments ago about supply and demand conditions. Let's move to the different types of financial market participants in these commodity futures markets. So let's make sure you get what's going on here. And we'll do this in a few slides, but let me just preview it to you. We have, we have a spot market. So that spot market is for the exchange of cash for a commodity today. But we also have a futures market, which is no exchange of cash today. It's just an agreement to trade at some future date of that commodity at a pre-agreed upon price. So there are two dominant participants in this market. Those are hedgers and speculators. And the hedgers are those businesses or individuals or groups of individuals or governments who have a position in the commodity. In other words, if I'm a farmer and I own a gigantic uh, apple orchard and I have these beautiful honey crisp apples, this is your homework assignment. Go buy a honey crisp apple. You ever eat one of these things? It's like biting into a filet. They're so juicy and so tasty. So I have this, I have this gigantic farm of honey crisp apples. Well, what's my risk? I have commodity price risk. The price of apples could go way up, which would be good for me, or the price of apples could go way down, which would be bad for me. So what I wanna do as a good financial manager of this Honeycrisp apple farm is to manage that commodity price risk. And one way to do that is with a futures contract. So I'm gonna to go to the futures contract and I'm gonna lock in a future selling price of my Honeycrisp apples. So that whether the price goes way up or way down or way up or way down, I have guaranteed a future value of my apples. Now, of course, in order to do that, I'm gonna sell in the futures market, right? I'm long in the spot market, I'm naturally long. I benefit when prices rise. 
So I need to take the opposite position in the futures market. I'll take the short position. So there you have the short hedgers, producers of the commodity. But if I'm a food store and I buy apples, I'm a user of the commodity. And so naturally I'm short in the spot market, right? I benefit when the prices fall. So I'm gonna have to take the long position in the futures market. And so the hedgers, if there are short hedgers and long hedgers in the futures market for Honeycrisp apples, which by the way, there are no Apple futures contracts because there's not enough volatility in the price. But if there are the same number of hedgers on both sides, well, then everybody's happy. And there's market clearing prices. The consequence is when there are way more short hedgers or way more long hedgers, then we've got something going on. We'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. Now, there are lots of people out there who might look over at my farm and say, you know what, Jim's price of his uh, Honeycrisp apple is $3 an apple. I think that price is going to rise. So I can speculate on that. I can just jump into the futures market and take the long position in a futures contract, betting that the price of a Honeycrisp apple is going to rise. Or, or if I think the price of Honeycrisp apples is going to fall, I'll take the short position. And notice that last diamond point down there. I think this is super important. So what the speculators are hoping to do is, of course, of course, generate a capital gain, whether they have the long or the short position, but they're also going to earn profits by providing some extra liquidity. I mean, this is how and why futures markets are so successful, because they offer tremendous amounts of liquidity. Investors, whether they're hedgers or speculators, can get in and out of the market super quickly. But I'm guessing you guys remember the importance of liquidity going all the way back to level one. Now, there are some arbitrage opportunities, even in the commodity market. And so there are arbitrageurs in there. Mostly they're taking advantage on futures mispricing because remember that lots of spot prices are local based on local weather conditions and all those other factors that we talked about before, supply and demand. And so you gotta translate that into a global futures market. And so sometimes there's uh, mispricing. The exchanges, of course, uh, New York Mercantile Exchange, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. I've been to both of those exchanges and they're, they're fascinating places to visit. Uh, I, I wouldn't wanna trade there every day because it would give me one of my ocular migraine headaches. Uh, but they're super exciting and super fun. But the exchanges then, of course, they are there for a variety of reasons, but primarily to facilitate trading, which means the exchange has to establish rules, things like margins and things like uh, standardization and other factors that uh, facilitate a smooth clearing of the market. And then how about commodity market analysts? This is what I teach my students. I say, look, you know, there are lots and lots of really cool careers that you can have uh, as a financial analyst. And I have lots of students who say things like, you know what, I, I would like to just sit in the back by a computer and research stuff. And here we go. Commodity market analyst is a perfect job for that. And then regulators, whether these are government regulators or authoritative body regulators, or maybe just uh, self regulators, you know, like the exchanges have all these rules and then they have to regulate these rules. All right, here's a good slide that tells you about spot and futures price, which I talked about just a few minutes ago. A couple of things on the right hand side. Look down on the bottom right. If we start with the spot price and we subtract out, that's a minus sign there in between those two ovals. If we subtract out the futures price, we get what's known as the basis. The basis is just the difference between those two prices. So just at the risk of offending you, if the spot and futures price are the same uh, dollar amount, then the basis is zero. And so the question then becomes, how wide can that basis get? I mean, clearly, if we're trading my Honeycrisp apple and I can sell it for $3 in the spot market, you're probably not going to offer to buy that from me in the three-month futures market for $100. 
right? There has to be some, some connection between the spot and the futures price. Although I will say, for those of you who like history lessons, go back to the uh, tulip bulb mania uh, fiasco hundreds of years ago over in Holland. Uh, individuals, this is pretty much almost the first futures market, individuals were mortgaging their houses to actually buy tulip bulbs. And some of them, these tulip bulbs were actually buried somewhere and you, you couldn't even see these things. So go ahead and scratch your head and think to yourself, oh boy, I wonder how long that market lasted. And then look up at the top right there. Let me just make sure you understand this. So one of the standardization uh, constructs that the exchanges require for all of us who want to trade there is they get to pick what month. So there might be a there might be a March contract, there might be a June and a September contract, and so each of those contracts is probably going to have different prices. And so you, if you take the difference between the near maturity, like let's say the March, versus the longer maturity, let's say the June, you get what's known as the calendar spread. Now let's work back to these two funny words, contango and backwardation. Uh, these are super complicated words that describe a super simple result. So look under the first circle point under contango. All we're saying is that when the futures price exceeds the spot price, we call that contango. And that's the red curve on the graph over there to the right. When the futures price is less than the spot price, we call that backwardation, and that's the green curve over on that graph on the right. With contango, there's going to be a negative basis in calendar spread. With backwardation, there's going to be a positive basis in calendar spread. And based on those two equations right there, that should be an obvious notion to you. So the question then becomes, why, why would we have contango, why would we have backwardation under what conditions? And we'll talk about this at length here over the next few slides. But I want you to think about the crazy scenario where the futures price is always equal to the spot price and the basis is zero and then the calendar spread is zero and those two prices just move in unison. Well, that's kind of an ideal scenario, but there are lots and lots of variables that go in into determining spot prices and future pr futures prices. Not least of which is going back to my example is that, look, if you want to buy this gold ring from me in six months, I'm going to charge you to store it on my finger because, oh man, it's hurting my hand, you know, gets in the way of my golf swing. I can't make a left-handed layup. So I'm I'm suffering pain by holding on to this uh, gold band for you. So I'm going to make you pay for that. So there are storage costs, but there are also, and this is what this part of the reading emphasizes, there's also the relationship between long hedging and short hedging. I want you to focus on those two bottom uh, embedded bullet points under both contango and backwardation. So I want you to think about this. If we have a scenario where the market is dominated by long hedgers, then, then we're going to have contango because what are those long hedgers doing? Those long hedgers are taking the long position in the futures market and they're bidding up the price of the futures contract. So the futures price is going to exceed the spot price. On the other hand, let's just flip it upside down back to me as the uh, Honeycrisp apple farmer. If the market is dominated by short hedgers, then we have tons and tons of farmers are out there who are shorting the contract. And you know, when there's tons of shorters out there, the price gets bid down. So we'll have the concept where the futures price is less than the spot price. And so I think this is a great exam question. Look at those two bottom embedded bullet points. Remember, in fact, get your camera out, take a picture of that. Futures markets dominated by long hedgers tend to be in contango and then just the opposite for short hedgers. In fact, I bet if you memorize those two sentences somewhere on the exam, uh, it'll, be, it'll be helpful. All right, let's continue this discussion about backwardation and contango and ask ourselves, all right, there are probably people out there who've thought about this more than just Jim and his apple orchard, right? So let's go back to a real famous uh, economist back in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, 
Um, uh, this was originally called the insurance theory, but it's now become known as normal backwardation. And this tells us that the futures price is going to be lower than the current spot price, mostly because, and let's go ahead and read that, that red second arrow point. Commodity futures returns are driven by the desire of the commodity producers to reduce their price risk. This is what we were saying before. And so what the speculators then are doing is they're essentially providing insurance. Remember the short hedgers are trying to lock in a future value of their commodity. In my case, it's the apples to avoid, you know, tremendous volatility. Well, what we find out is that, look at the bottom arrow point, markets do not match this hypothesis. In fact, the reading uh, refers to a handful of academic articles that say, you know what, this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. I'm not quite sure, I'm not quite sure how that fits into questioning on the CFA exam, but if you remember things like re managing the risk, reducing their price risk and uh, backwardation, that futures price is gonna be lower than the spot price. I think you'd be able to answer an insurance theory or a normal backwardation theory. Now, of course, over time, some of the good things from that particular theory were combined with some new thoughts to give this hedging pressure hypothesis. And uh, this is when I think that you'll kind of wrap your arms around this here. Um, look at that first arrow point both producers and consumers. Of course, of course, producers and consumers are gonna protect themselves from commodity price risk. Look at that embedded, uh, that indented arrow point. They enter price hedges to stabilize their cash flows. Of course, what did I say earlier? They're locking in their future value. So both producers and consumers, they wanna avoid volatility. Oh my gosh, so that makes perfect sense, right? So look at the last two, uh, look at the last two. When the producer's hedging behavior dominates, the market will be in backwardation. When the consumer's behavior dominates, the market will be in contango. So let me go back to, uh, where do I have it? Let's go back to this uh, right-hand side illustration. Of course, look at that graph, look at that illustration and say to yourself, all right, we've got two groups of hedgers. You ready there? Look at those two, look at those two embedded bullet points I told you to memorize. So here's the summation of what I was saying earlier. Yes, the red line can tango, the right line or the right curve is going to be uh, backwardation. So go ahead and memorize those two, uh, those two final sentences under hedging pre pressure hypothesis. I'm going to repeat them. When producers hedging behavior dominates, market will be in backwardation. When the consumer's behavior dominates, the market will be in contango. Now, let's get back to my idea of the storage here. Um, there's a theory of storages. It focuses on how the level of commodity inventories help shape the commodity futures price curves. All right, so let's think about this. Let's suppose that I own the only gold ring. And here, let's just go out on a crazy limb. Suppose that this is the ring from the Lord of the Rings. It's the only one, right? And I have it on my, of course, if I put it on my hand, I guess I would disappear. Uh, I haven't seen those movies in a long time, but I think that's what the, what the ring does. But if, if we have a scenario under which there is a low supply of the commodity, then that's gonna have an impact on prices. On the other hand, if there are a billion people out there that have this ring on their finger, you know, if there's tons of supply, that's gonna have a different impact. All right, so let me go ahead and read that first arrow point again. Focuses on how the level of commodity inventories will shape what happens not only in the spot market, but more importantly, in the futures market. All right, let's read that last one down there. A regularly stored commodity should have a higher price. So this should be contango to account for storage costs. Wow. Now, it, you know, storing on my finger is really not that great of an example, but let's go back to my apple. If you want to buy this apple from me, and let's suppose, what did I say that price was in the spot market? $3? 
So if you say to me, Jim, I want to buy that apple in six months, well, I'm going to have to store that apple. So I'm going to have to refrigerate it. I'm going to have to make sure the air is clean around it. I'm going to have to hire somebody to stand around the refrigerator so that it doesn't get stolen. I'm going to have to uh, have somebody make sure that the worms don't get in it or ants don't get in it. So I have all of these tons of costs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass those costs along to you which means the futures price is going to be higher than the spot price, which reflects the cost of storage. Therefore, Contango, notice we have Contango bolded in red. Now, on the other hand, on the other hand, suppose that you don't really feel like paying me for storage because you say, wait a minute, Jim, there's a million people that have this ring or there's a million farmers out there with just as many uh, juicy and ripe honey crisp apples well then demand dominates supply and will be in backwardation and so this can be summarized by saying all right futures price go over the far right futures price is the summation of the spot price I mean of course we know that in every derivative conversation that we've always had the futures price you start with the spot price and then you're going to add those direct storage costs whatever they are and then you're going to subtract out a convenience yield. And I think this is a really cool concept here, convenience yield. What did I say just earlier? That the supply of the commodity goes up and down. So when do you want to own that commodity? You want to own that commodity when you're the only one who still has ownership of that commodity, right? So the convenience yield is the simple fact that, look, if I have my honey crisp apple tree in the backyard and I was prescient enough to go ahead and spray it against a new type of a, of a worm, and all of the Honeycrisp apple orchards all over the country are now being eaten by this worm, I have this yield, right? I have the only good Honeycrisp apple, so I can sell them at a much higher price, right? So what I need to do is subtract out that convenience yield. You know, there is no convenience yield if there are tons of Honeycrisp apples out there. All right, let's look at this LOS, describe, interpret, and calculate. So some of you should be salivating out there. We get to get our calculators out and do something. But let me warn you that this is not very exciting, and it's, uh, it's pretty simple math. All right, so what are we doing? We have the spot yield. Sometimes that's called the price return. We have the roll yield. A lot of times that's called the roll return. And then, of course, remember, in futures markets, we need to put up some type of collateral. And... A lot of times that's cash. <laughs> Sometimes it could be treasury bills, but I, I don't know. I guess I could take my, if this were the Lord of the Rings ring, I bet I could use that as collateral on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. All right, price return. This is a simple F over P minus one, future over present minus one. There's the standard formula for holding period return that you first learned. Boy, I'm sure you didn't first learn it back in level one. You learned it back in fifth grade. Now skip down to the collateral turn, return first because this is a super obvious one. That's the yield or the interest rate on the bonds or the cash used to maintain uh, the futures position, which is, remember there's, remember, there's an initial margin and then there's a maintenance margin. And then depending on prices, th those margins can change. But th remember, those margins are set by the exchange and they're probably determined whether or not uh, based on the type of a client you are. Like me, like Jim, just a regular old college professor, I'd probably have to put up lots and lots of, uh, of a margin or collateral. But some of you who are way wealthier than I am or you know, a pension fund that has $100 billion in assets would probably be able to get away with less. All right, let's look at that roll return up there. What we're gonna do is we're going to roll. We're gonna just roll one contract over into the next one. So we, we have a position in a futures contract and it matures. And what we do then is that we just go ahead and take the same position in the next contract. So let's go ahead and read that uh, embedded circle point. It's the accounting difference between the expiring or the maturing futures contract and the new futures contract price. 
And this is important here. And hopefully, based on my previous uh, descriptions and discussions, you'll know that this will be positive if the uh, commodity market is in backwardation, it'll be negative if it is contango. Let me, gosh, just let me go back here and say, yep, there we go. Contango, we're rolling down. Backwardation, we're rolling up. And so that should make sense. Where am I here? Here we go. So if we're in backwardation, the roll return will be positive. If we're in contango, the roll return will be negative. And then you can earn some type of an incremental return by rebalancing the portfolio. So let's take a look at an example here. And by the way, this example is very similar to the one in the reading. And this is what I was saying earlier, that don't get your hopes up to do some kind of complex math. This is not complex at all. So we have a 5% price return, 2.5% roll return, position for one year, uh, risk-free rate of return of 2%. So here, you're ready to be dulled away by some math. Five plus two and a half plus two, there you go, nine and a half percent. Um, we get the uh, total return. Now this gets a little bit more interesting here. Contrast the roll return in contango and backwardation. And so what did we say earlier? Roll return is negative. And here's the example. We have 769 and 774. So you just do the math pretty quickly. You get a minus 6 point, uh, I'm sorry, 0.65%. If you do backwardation down here, 720 to 717, you get a positive 0.42%. So there's nothing really fancy or complex about this. This is just another illustration of what I was saying to you earlier. Now this happens to be my favorite part of this reading. I love swap contracts. I love talking about swap contracts. And I always explain to my students that swap contracts really are nothing more than a implementation and an execution of the grass is greener over on the other side model that sometimes we live our life by. So let me give you just a quick example here. I'm gonna continue with my example of my Honeycrisp apple in my backyard, Honeycrisp apple tree. So I go out there every day, I pick an apple, I come in and I eat it, and I, I make apple pie, and my wife and children, they make apple cobbler, and we have apples all the time. And so sooner or later, we're gonna get sick of apples. My neighbor, right across the fence in our backyard, she has a beautiful peach tree. So doesn't it make sense to think that sooner or later, she and her husband and her family are gonna get sick of peaches. So it makes sense that we swap these things. And that's really all a commodity swap is. We're gonna swap an apple for a peach. Now, of course, in my example, we're just swapping kind of consumption behaviors, but pension funds and endowment funds and uh, high net worth investors they're probably less interested in biting into a peach or an apple during the course of breakfast. But what they might be interested in is swapping price changes based on the price of peaches and the price of apples at some, to at some point in the future. So that's where we go from actual exchanging the commodity, an apple for a peach, to exchanging cash flows based on the prices of those commodities. So look at that second embedded bullet point. It offers the benefit of risk management and risk transfer. So if I'm swapping an apple for a peach, then what I'm doing is I'm managing risk. I'm transferring risk. I'm giving the risk of apple consumption to my neighbor and I'm assuming the risk of peach consumption for me. Now, for the pension fund that I talked about a moment ago, what they're doing, the pension fund is transferring the risk of the volatility in Apple prices over that way and accepting the risk of the volatility of peach prices. So it's a risk transfer. So the grass is greener on the other side. You guys get that, that we're saying, okay, we have, we have Apple risk exposure, whatever that means, but we don't want that anymore. We want peach risk exposure. So it is a hedge. It's a hedge, but it's not in the hedge in the traditional sense in which we are 
eliminating risk or even reducing risk. We're just taking on a different kind of risk. Now look at the bottom one there. This is a great advantage. Allows more customization than futures contracts. I love that one. All right, so let's go through some of these uh, uh, commodity swap examples. So a total return swap, how would this work? Well, let's suppose that we pick an index of commodity. So notice it says change in the level of an index. So let's take an Apple futures contract and a peach futures contract, even though there are no such things. And then an, uh, a, a natural gas futures contract, which there is, and a lumber futures contract, which there is, and a chicken futures contract, which I don't think there is, and then a cattle future. So we, we take all of these futures contracts and we lump them into an index. And so what we say is something like, okay, you and I are on opposite sides of this swap we'll say something like, hey, if the price of that index, if the value of that index goes up, you owe me a bunch of money based on the notional amount. If it goes down, then I owe you a bunch of money. So that's a total return swap. So think of the index, and by the way, the index could be almost anything, right? Could be the example that I gave, or it could be an index of different energies. It could be an index of different uh, metals. It could be almost anything. But what we're doing is we're betting on the value of a commodity. So what this does, this gives us a direct exposure to those commodities inside of the index. And so if we win when prices go up, that's great. And when we lose, when prices go down, well, we'll have to accept that. An excess return swap is very similar. However, you lock into a rate somewhere, you know, like take the price of oil. So let's suppose price of a barrel of oil is 50 and that's our fixed rate or our fixed level or our fixed price. And so what's going to happen is that we'll exchange payments based on the price of a barrel of oil when it goes up or whether it goes down in relation to that that fixed $50. And so read that with me calculated by changes in the level of the index relative uh, to a benchmark of a fixed level. And it could be it could be like I just described price of a barrel of oil, or it could be an index. Uh, basis swap, we could, uh, my neighbor and I, we could swap the basis of apples and peaches, right? The basis for apples might be, what did I say? The price of an apple was $3. Maybe the futures price of an apple is $3.50. The price of a peach, let's say it's $2 and the futures price of the peach is $2.20 or some other number. And so we have the two bases and we're just going to swap. So what we're doing is betting on whether the basis goes up or down in each of those and we'll just swap those payments. Uh, a variant swap. Now what we're going to do is swap the standard deviation of peaches or apples and what we'll do is we'll establish what that standard deviation or variance that's why it's called a variance swap we'll establish that fixed standard deviation level and this works a little bit like that excess return swap above and whenever the volatility is above i pay you whenever the volatility is below you pay me but then a volatility swap is we're going to swap volatility of the peach and the apple and so this is a true this is like a true uh, risk swap. So imagine what I was saying earlier about getting exposure to commodities. We can do it through futures contracts, right, as a speculator, but we can also do it in these types of swaps. Remember, when you go through the futures market, you have to pay attention to all of the rules that are outlined by the futures exchanges. When you go in the swap market, this is pretty much an over-the-counter market, and you get to pick your terms. You can pick the notional. I mean, you can't pick like, you know, $100. I mean, you need to pick some, some larger amount in the notional. So it's probably not available to me, a humble college professor, but a pension fund can clearly meet uh, the notional of 100 million or 500 million. I mean, I always tell my students that, look, if you, if you could travel through time, what you would simply do is just 
travel through time tomorrow. Let's make it really easy. Why, why, why make it so difficult? Like in Back to the Future, Doc went, you know, 30 years into the future. Just go to tomorrow and get a Wall Street Journal. Bring it back to me today. Let's look at the prices of all these commodities. Let's figure out which ones are most profitable. And then let's pick up the phone and call a financial institution and say, all right, we want a volatility swap on peaches and apples. And we want it in the amount of $1 trillion because we know we're going to win. And so that notional is going to be the, uh, the dictator of the volume and the magnitude of the profit, comma, or loss. <laughs> All right, uh, commodity indexes. This is pretty simple stuff. So there's an example at the bottom slide, bottom of the slide of the different types of pretty much globally accepted commodity indices. What are they used for? This is probably a good exam question as a benchmark. Uh, they're used for forecasting and they're a basis for investment vehicles, right? There are lots of ETFs out there that trade on these types of indexes, as you can imagine. Now let's go ahead and dive into the composition and the construction of these different kinds of indexes. So this sounds to me an awful lot like a great comparison question on the exam, where the Institute would give you a column over here of, let's say, let's say uh, Jim's index, and then over here, uh, Jen's index. And over here, there'll be some rows about breadth of cover coverage. So number of commodities in each index. Jim might have 10 commodities. Jen might have 100 different commodities, right? And then we might weight them differently. We might roll them differently. We might rebalance them differently. And Jim and Jen may have different governance procedures about things like weighting and rolling and when we rebalance and all those kinds of things. So I think that is a really, really cool question. Uh, this one back here is probably uh, just background information. And I think that takes us through all of those LOSs. Um, I had a great time reviewing and preparing for this one. I, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Thank you for watching.